we all have moments where we feel like we have no control over what we feel, but we all have more control over what we experience and what we feel than we think we do. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 267. Today, we're talking to Lisa Feldman Barrett about the science of self-care. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, now with over a million downloads. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so happy you're here today. This is going to be an amazing conversation. I This is one of the top conversations I may have ever had with a human being. I am so excited to share it with you. Hey, welcome if you're brand new. What a great episode to dive into because in a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Lisa Feldman Barrett. She is a professor of psychology and director of the Interdisciplinary Effective Science Laboratory at Northeastern University. She is one of the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research on psychology and neuroscience. She's the author of the books, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain, and Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. She holds appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She's amazing. And we're going to be talking about self-care, about how the brain and the body work, how emotions work with the brain and the body. You're going to have this incredible understanding of how the body can run this negative body budget and what's really happening. It is so fascinating. And one of the things we keep circling back to is this feeling of self-care or this need for self-care and how important it is for our brain and body to work well. And you're going to understand that so thoroughly by the end of this conversation. I guarantee you're going to want to listen to this conversation multiple times. There is so much here. You're going to learn about how, which this totally surprised me, how emotions aren't happening to you, how your brain makes them as you need them, and how practicing a skill in your brain really helps your brain to predict outcomes in the future, helps you, can help you have a more positive life in so many ways. And we're going to talk about the body budget, which you'll hear what that is. Before we dive in, I just want to mention that, you know, many of you have asked about the mindful parenting membership, taking this deeper, what you learn here on the podcast, deeper with the membership. And so I thought I'd share some recent member wins. G has found that her kids are doing so much better when she is present and that doing yoga helps her come back to her senses and be less reactive. R had a big awareness this week about recognizing how her relationship with her stepson is affecting her response to her younger children. So much there. N has three small boys and she was struggling to get them all out of the house. It was really stressing her out, but she has been really focusing on the work we do in the membership, getting back into her meditation. And last week she took them to the zoo for a day and she actually had the best time ever. And I'm so thrilled for her. You know, you should know that I no longer offer any one-on-one coaching or group coaching anymore. So the only way to work with me is through joining Mindful Parenting. I heard a teaching from my teacher, the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, talking about the importance of not doing it alone, not practicing alone. Like we need the teaching, we need the community. And the community makes such a big difference. It really can be the difference between learning something in some way on your own, but then going faster, going farther, going deeper, 
with these things that matter so much to us about being more grounded, being more present, and being able to create those relationships using skillful communication and mindfulness that we really want. So if you want to learn more, you want to get on the wait list for the Mindful Parenting membership for the next time it opens, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com. And that's all at mindfulmamamentor.com. So powerful. All right. So let's do this. This conversation with Lisa Feldman Barrett is amazing. So join me at the table as I talk to Lisa Feldman Barrett. All right, Lisa, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. It is my pleasure. You're, you're quite, you're quite a, I'm, I'm like a little bit of a fangirl of yours. So you're, you're, you're quite a get for me in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really delighted to be here. So thanks so much for having me uh, on your, on your show. Um, so I was thinking about how to talk about your work and we talk a lot about parenting here. And so I thought it might be interesting to kind of think about like the movie inside out, right? Like i I'm guarantee you've seen it, right? The, the Pixar movie and the, the emotions in the brain and there's anger and joy. And for a lot of us parents, we're like, wow, this is great. Like, this is a great way to talk about feelings for kids and just to like kind of accept the, you know, all our feelings as normal and they're just there in general all the time. It, but it, this is not re- quite exactly how feelings work, even though as adults, we kind of think of this as in some way, like loosely as kind of, kind of how feelings work. So can you tell us, help us understand emotions better Then they're, they're obviously not like the little creatures in our heads, but help us understand it a little better. Sure. I will say that if you think about inside out as a cartoon, it is a great cartoon and it is really useful tool for helping kids accept their feelings, regardless of what the feelings are. You know, all feelings are authentic, right? As long as they're authentic, they're meaningful and they should be um, uh, acknowledged. Um, But I guess what I would say is, you know, I also like Roadrunner cartoons and I particularly like when Roadrunner, you know, runs uh, off the cliff and doesn't fall down. And then Wile E. Coyote, who's following Roadrunner, runs off the cliff looks down and then falls down. That's also really fun. Of course, it doesn't really reflect how physics works in the real world. And we would never actually uh, think that we could teach someone physics by watching Roadrunner cartoons. And I would say the same thing about Inside Out. It's a great film. It's really fun. Pixar does a great job in general of embedding emotions into all kinds of things like cars and robots and toys and even humans. The problem really isn't with the film itself. It's with people who claim that the film reflects something scientifically accurate about how emotions work in your brain. Um, Because you don't have little creatures in your brain. And in fact, you know, anger, say, or sadness or joy, um, it's not one thing. When you feel joy, uh, the various instances where you feel joy, you you're not feeling the same thing every single time. You're not doing the same thing. Your body isn't doing the same thing. Your face isn't doing the same thing. You know, think about anger, for example. What are all the things that you do when you're angry? Sometimes you might yell, but sometimes you might cry. Sometimes you might laugh. Sometimes you might um, stomp your foot. Sometimes you might be completely stony silent. Mm -hmm. And what's going on inside your body really is yoked to what your brain is preparing for you to physically do next. So anger or any emotion isn't one thing. It's a category of variable instances. That doesn't mean like completely random, but you know, you don't always scowl when you're angry. In fact, you probably rarely scowl when you're angry. The data show that people scowl about 30% of the time when they're angry in Western cultures. Um, which means 70% of the time you're doing something else with your face that's meaningful. And you also scowl when you're not angry. Mm -hmm. And um, you scowl when someone told you a bad joke. You scowl when you're concentrating hard on something. You scowl when you have gas. So there's no... (laughs) (laughs) So the point is that there's tremendous variability when it comes to emotion. Um, Variability is the norm. and 
our job as scientists is to understand what creates that variation. And our job as parents is to really help kids grapple with that variation. Um, so, you know, to create an environment that where they can learn when a scowl means anger and when a scowl means uh, that someone is concentrating really hard or that somebody just told a really bad joke. Mm. Okay. So like um, I'm imagining, you know, one of the things we do to kind of teach emotional intelligence is we say, hmm, I wonder what so-and-so is feeling right now. You know, like I wonder what's going on and kind of invite that conversation. But kind of what I'm hearing from you is that maybe part of that conversation should be, um, but we can also never really know what's going on for another person. Or yeah. Being. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I would say, first of all, in half the world, emotions are not about feelings. They're about actions. Hmm. So in some cultures, it doesn't matter what you feel. It matters what you're likely to do next. And in fact, from your brain's perspective, that's what your brain is always trying to do. It's always trying to predict what's going to happen next. So um, in our culture, in Western culture, we usually assume that some kind of internal force, like a feeling or a thought, is the driver of emotion, the driver of the actions that we uh, engage in during emotion. But that's really not the idea that pervades half the world in half the world. Feelings are just not relevant. Um, what matters is what you're going to do next. And so, what this means is that when you are asking children um, to articulate, think about, reflect on what somebody else might be feeling, it's fine to do that in this culture because you're acculturating them, you're teaching them what emotion means in this culture. It's just, you know, you should be aware that that's not true everywhere in the world. Um, in some parts of the world, it doesn't matter what people feel or what they think, only matters what they do in a specific situation. So I think that's the first thing to realize. And I think the second thing to realize is that, yeah, from your brain's perspective, you don't read people, you don't read their emotions, you don't, we don't read their, there is no such thing as body language, you know, bodily movements aren't a language to be read like words on a page. Your brain is always guessing. And it's a really good idea to teach your kids that they're guessing. They're mm -hmm. guessing what uh, the raise of an eyebrow means or the tone of voice or what a certain action means. They're guessing and sometimes they can be wrong. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. Water and fiber are two essential components for everyone to stay hydrated and to have good digestive health. But most of us, most of us seriously lacking in both of them. Adults, we need around 25 grams of fiber a day. And I personally, I knew I wasn't hitting that. That's why I'm so excited for the easy way to drink more water, consume more fiber and reduce sugar all with Hello Water. Hello Water is the fiber infused fruit flavored water with zero sugar. The number one reason we aren't drinking enough water is because of boring taste. I mean, at least it was for my daughter who's like a camel, but Hello Water offers seven great tasting flavors like lemon lime, mixed berry and orange mango, and they're naturally sweetened with stevia. So they're light and refreshing with no artificial sweeteners or flavors. Each Hello Water bottle has five grams of prebiotic fiber that's derived from chicory root. So it keeps me and my daughter hydrated and helps both of us hit our daily fiber intake. My favorite Hello Water is cucumber lime and orange mango. And my daughter and I both love mixed berry enormously. I'm psyched because my 11 year old, she was like a camel, not drinking any water. And she loves the Hello Water. So she's getting all this hydration and fiber that she wasn't getting before. And it really is easy to grab and go. And I've definitely noticed my digestion has improved with the increased fiber and water. 
So I invite you to add Hello Water to your daily routine like I did. And right now, my listeners can get 10% off your entire first order. Just head to hellowater.com and use my promo code HUNTER for 10% off right now. That's hellowater.com, promo code HUNTER. Sometimes my oldest daughter, she gets like really annoyed if I try to guess what her feelings are. Don't assume, you know, don't make an assumption about what I'm going through, you know, and, 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 and so she would really like what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me when I tell you that my daughter loves what I'm saying until I'm saying it about her and yeah. then, you know, all bets are off. So though, well, this is fascinating. So like we don't read people, the brain is always guessing. So maybe you can kind of take us back a bit. Cause I love how you talk about the the purpose of the brain right like we think that the purpose of the brain is to think and maybe there are feelings involved in there but but it's it's really interesting because it's you talk about this a little bit like it's it's more about survival so this guessing that we're talking you're talking about is our survival in a so as a social species, right? Like we're trying to guess because that's part of our survival as a social species. So anyway, take us back a little bit to tell us a little bit about that piece about the brain. And Sure. I think it's pretty common for scientists and non-scientists alike to assume that the brain is for whatever we value about ourselves. So as a species, we value our, we value our ability to be empathic. We value our ability to think, to plan, to reason. Um, And, um, and so a lot of scientific investigation has been dedicated to the search for the sort of evolutionary principles that gave us the kind of brain we have rooted in the kinds of things that we do that other animals don't do so well, like, Mm -hmm. you know, reason and build civilizations and so on. The thing is that when you go all the way back to the beginning um, uh, of um, time before when animals on this planet didn't have brains, as a general rule, right? No, no animals had brains at a certain point. Sometimes yeah. it feels now like animals don't, uh, some of our human animals don't have brains. Um, but uh, there was actually a time when the world was ruled by animals who didn't have brains. And what we can learn from that and also learn from the anatomy of the brain and its connections is that your brain's most important job is in thinking. It's not feeling, it's not even seeing. Your brain's most important job is to regulate the systems of your body to keep you alive and well. And everything it does, thinking, feeling, seeing, it's doing in the service of keeping your body alive and well, of of integrating and having um, coordination between the systems of your body. Now, we don't experience every hug we get or every insult we bear Um, every feeling we have. We don't experience ourselves that way, but that actually is what's going on under the hood. Um, We can't really say why brains evolved, and it's probably the case that brains didn't, you know, brains evolved for probably more than one reason, but we can say that the brain's most important job is to keep you alive and to keep you well and, um, you know, so that you can pass your genes on to the next generation. and then help that generation survive to reproductive age. Mm -hmm. But all the things that we do that are unique and wonderful, we do in the service of that ultimate goal. And the feelings that we have are very tied to this regulation in ways that most people are not aware of. And when they become aware of it, it really changes their way of being in the world. So one of the questions I get constantly all the time is about like with parents, when we get dysregulated, when we get that, you know, we get stressed out and frustrated with our kids' behavior and parents want to yell and talking about how to calm down in that moment. So if feelings are tied to regulation in that moment, 
I guess, you know, how, what, walk us through what's going on there. Sure. So your brain um, is regulating the systems of your body. And the way to describe this, the way I describe it is that your brain is running a budget for your body. So you've got all these moving parts inside your body that you're largely unaware of, but they all have to be coordinated with each other in order for you to survive and, and live uh, and maybe even thrive. Um, and so your brain is budgeting. It's not budgeting money, but it's budgeting glucose and salt and water and oxygen and all of the, the resources um, that are necessary to keep you alive and well. And your brain um, is doing this largely, it doesn't, your brain doesn't make itself aware. So you are not aware of most of this budgeting as it goes on. In fact, as you and I are chatting here right now, there's a whole drama going on in each of us, actually, as, as our listeners are listening to this, there's a, each one of them has a whole drama going on inside, you know, their own bodies that they're largely unaware of um, because we're not really wired to feel every tug of a, of, of a lung and every, you know, gush of blood and every change in temperature. If we were uh, aware, we would never pay attention to anything outside our own skin ever again. Cause there's like a really, a lot of drama going on inside there. And I mean, just remember, for example, I don't know if this, I'm sure this must've happened to you if you have kids where the first time, you know, a fetus kicks you somewhere inside your body, like hits some organ or something. And it's like the weird, you're like, what is that? Like, I don't even know what that, what was that feeling? I'm not even sure. And it's because you don't normally, yeah, you don't, but you don't normally sense things and it's vague and you can't really, you know, even for something like appendicitis, you don't, you have sort of a dull ache in your whole abdomen. It doesn't, you don't get the pinpoint pain right on top of the appendix until right before it's about to burst. So there's just a kind of vagueness there. That's how we're wired. But evolution has provided us with kind of a workaround so that we generally know, is our body budget in the red or is it solvent? Like are things generally okay or is there a problem? And um, not a problem, but like, are we, are we running a deficit? Yeah, like and do you need that, more resources somewhere? Yeah, exactly. And so that is mood or um, what scientists uh, like me call affect. Now affect or mood is not emotion. It's a consequence of body budgeting. Your brain is always budgeting for your body your whole life from the moment that you're born until the moment that you die. And you are always experiencing that body budgeting as mood. So mood is a property of of being conscious. And sometimes our brain conjures out of that uh, an emotion. Because what is, when you feel unpleasant, what does that tell you about what's wrong? Does it doesn't tell you what's wrong? Doesn't tell you what you should do about what's wrong. There's no there's no map there. There's no real information other than oh, there's a body budgeting deficit. So what do you do? If you think about it, when you have a tug in your chest or you feel distressed, you know, is that anxiety? Is it hunger? Um, is there a physical problem? Like, you know, for example, the tug that pe- this tightness that people feel in their chest right before they have a heart attack is exactly the same tightness that you feel with indigestion. And it's exactly the same tightness that you feel with, a, with um, anxiety. It's not that the person can't tell the difference. It's that there really is no, you, you, you can't detect a difference. It really feels the same to you because we, we just don't have the same amount of precision um, uh, with sensing the body as we do with seeing and hearing and touch, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and this is really how your brain works. Every waking moment, actually your whole life, right? Your brain is stuck in a dark silent box called your skull. And it's receiving sense data from your body and from the world. And what it's receiving are the outcomes of something that happened, but it doesn't know the cause. 
So when your brain receives, you know, a loud bang, well, what caused it? You need to know what caused it in order to know what to do about it. Did a door slam? Did somebody drop a box? Did a car backfire? Is it thunder? Is it a gunshot? Like, what is it, right? But your brain doesn't know. Your brain only knows the outcome. It doesn't know the cause. Similarly, when you have a tug in your chest, what is it? What caused it? You know, your brain doesn't know. It has to guess because it only has, it only has access to the outcomes, not the causes. And this is called a reverse inference problem. And this reverse inference problem is the problem that your brain has to solve in order to keep you alive and well. And so your brain has one other source of information and that is it has past experience. Mm. What the learning that has wired itself into your brain during development and throughout your whole life. So your brain can figuratively speaking, ask itself, well, the last time I was in this situation and my body was in this state, what, caused, you know, these, what caused these sensations and what did I do about it? So your brain is actually asking a question about similarity or equivalence saying the last time I was in this physical state, in this kind of a situation, the last time something similar happened, what did I do next? What did I see next? What did I hear next? Like what happened next? What was the cause of these sensations? So your brain is constructing a category essentially from your past experience, because in psychology, things which are similar to each other are called a category and things, mental representation of a category is a concept. So basically your brain is taking past experience and combining it in all kinds of ways to create a concept or a category in the moment to make sense of that tug in your chest and any other sense data that you are receiving in order to guide your action. And when your brain uses past experiences of emotion, then it's constructing an emotion. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. So my husband got a little annoyed at me the other day because I brought the pipette baby lotion into my studio and we are in a fight about it because we both love it so much. I'm so thrilled that Pipette is a sponsor because they're a clean baby and mom care and husband care brand with a mission to give every family the best start. And I don't know about you, but I have always been obsessed with having clean ingredients ever since my mother got a breast cancer diagnosis. And I read about things like parabens and all these ingredients that we put on our skin, which absorbs everything. So I am so happy to have Pipette as a sponsor because all their products are so clean. They really set a standard for clean and best performing products. While the FDA bans only 12 potentially harmful ingredients in skincare products, Pipette bans more than 2,000, ensuring its products are safe, effective, and only use non-toxic ingredients. And all of Pipette's products are made with a key ingredient, squalane. So when babies are born, their skin is coated with a creamy substance called vernix, which provides natural protections for newborns in the first few hours after birth. It's ultra rich, hydrating, and it has this molecule squalane, and it has this nourishing waterproofing effect on baby's skin. This squalane is your baby's built-in moisturizer. It's key to keeping baby's skin safe, but after that protective vernix absorbs, your baby's skin needs a little extra love and care, and that's where the squalane comes in. Pipette's products are EWG verified vegan, hypoallergenic, sustainable, pediatrician, and dermatologist approved. For any parent who wants what's best for their children or a husband who wants what's best for his skin, products that only use the safest ingredients for our kids' delicate skin, Pipette is really a customer favorite for its ultra gentle baby lotions, oils, and washes. And right now, we're giving you 30% off its entire collection of personal care items. You just go to pipetbaby.com and get 30% off with the coupon code HUNTER. That's pipetbaby.com, P-I-P-E-T-T-E, baby.com. Use HUNTER 
to get 30% off. That's pipettebaby.com. Get 30% off with the coupon code HUNTER. Okay, so when we're back to that like situation where you're triggered by your child, like a parent may find themselves in a situation with a two-year-old or something and the the whole, all the the data that's coming in to your body mind system is is exactly like maybe the data that was like when you were a kid right like that's what maybe why in, in some ways like why some you know we're like back in that parent child relationship it's like it could be like that category that's you know that of data it could be but i think i think the one thing that we all know we all know that it's really taxing to be a parent yeah but we don't really think about why it's taxing and the reason why it's taxing is because little infant brains are born under construction they can't body budget on their own they can't even burp by themselves they have to be taught to sleep they have to be taught to how to nurse they have to be taught how to burp really their gi tracks for the first three months or so don't really work you know, on their own really well. I mean, they can't even see really their, their, they can see only really in a limited way that their, even their visual system isn't completely formed when they're born. So we are doing all the body budgeting for our infants. Now we don't think of it that way. We don't think, oh, I'm regulating my infant's nervous system when you feed your baby and change your baby and hug your baby and talk to your baby. But that actually is what you're doing. You are creating or curating an environment that it, the that the infant's brain is wiring itself to and that burden is yours and you know whoever else is caring for the baby or your little kids but you know slowly over time kids come to you know their brains develop sufficiently to body budget more on their own but none of us actually body budgets completely on our own we we are social animals and what that means is we make, figuratively speaking, deposits and withdrawals in each other's body budgets all the time. So when you're responsible for a little body budget, it's really exhausting. And you can't always control what your child is going to do. So you're already, your body budget's already encumbered, basically. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, Sometimes we say, oh, you know, it's so stressful to be a parent. Um, but what is stress? Stress is just your brain preparing your body for a major metabolic outlay. And sometimes that major metabolic outlay is exercise. And sometimes it's learning something new. And when you're a parent, a lot of it, a lot of that metabolic outlay is investing in your child's body budget. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a situation where you know, you're feeling really distressed, your kid is crying or, you know, isn't behaving and, um, and you're kind of at your wits end, your brain can use all kinds of um, uh, past experiences uh, to, um, you know, regulate or predict what you should do next. Sometimes they are um, experiences from your past, but sometimes they might be experiences that you heard about from a friend, or they might be experiences that you saw on television, or maybe Hunter on somebody heard on your podcast, or um, they read in a book, or you know. And oftentimes, um, you know, what happens is parents will, you know, because in this culture we. We really do kind of like very automatically make inferences about other people's internal thoughts and feelings. We sometimes attribute to our children sophisticated thoughts and feelings that they absolutely do not have and could not have, you know? He's manipulating and, me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things I think that, um, you know, that we did very differently um, uh, when my daughter was very young is that you know, she's a little creature who is learning. Um, her brain is wiring itself to the world that we created for her. And she's learning, which is really taxing, actually. Like learning, the two most expensive things your brain can do are learn and move your body. So, you know, she's got a lot going on that she's learning. But 
sometimes learning uh, requires that you have mastery over your environment. So who's her environment? Us, we are her environment. When your kid man- tries to manipulate you, so-called manipulate you, one way to think about that is that that's a really good thing because your child is attempting to have agency, mastery, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually, you might not like it. I mean, I'm not saying I liked it and I'm not saying I always allowed it to happen, but secretly, internally, I was applauding. Actually, my husband and I would just applaud really after she would go to bed. like Because what it means is that she's an active little agent who is learning how to... Um, uh, you know, take control of her world. And that's a really good thing. And, you know, one thing we used to say to each other all the time was, it's really irritating now, but when she's 25, we're going to be really, really happy that she learned how to do this. Um, you so, want her to know her boundaries, right? She has to yeah, figure you, them out, right? Like, Well, you have to help her figure them yeah, out. Yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. set the context for her to discover them and learn about them. But the point is that she's not manipulating you in any malevolent way she couldn't possibly because she doesn't have the mental machinery to to do that yet you know um she's just trying to get what she wants in a way that is active and agentic like being an agent and that's a good thing especially for girls actually that's a really good thing um it's just that you know it has to be tempered for you know and so um you know, when I, um, one time I offered her, you know, did, do you want three little M&Ms or, uh, I think I offered her, what was I, I, do you want three M&Ms or do you want a cookie? And she said, I want two M&Ms in the cookie. And I was like, <laughs> "Had a girl, like inside. I was like, that a girl, that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. learn to negotiate. This is yeah, exactly. Thing, right? yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So my point is that, um, of course, I'm not reducing everything to body budgeting. I'm just saying that um, when you get frustrated, uh, you're having a battle of will with your kid. Partly, I think the thing to remember is you are not working always with a flushed budget. You know, your budget might be a little, you might be running a somewhat of a deficit, particularly if you're not sleeping enough and you're not eating healthfully, or if you're not exercising enough, if you're too sedentary, and there are all kinds of things which really tax our body budgets in ways that we're, you know, only just, people are only just now becoming aware of. But also, to some extent, it's a battle of control in a good way, in a good way. Really what you're teaching your kid is um, where it's um, okay to be you know, an agent and try to control your environment and where it's um, a good idea to, to dial that back a little bit. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. So if you care about sustainability and beauty, you are going to be just as thrilled as I am that Anna Luisa is a sponsor of the Mindful Mama podcast because right now I am wearing the most beautiful, highly crafted huggy hoop earrings that I have just been wearing for like weeks because they look great with everything. They're completely stylish and the best thing is they are carbon neutral. So right now you can get 10% off at analuisa.com by going to Anna Luisa, A N A L U I S A dot com slash hunter. And I'm so happy they're a sponsor because one of the big things that they do is that they're completely carbon neutral. They offset 100% of their commissions, starting with the sourcing of raw materials all the way to the disposal of the pieces. They make their pieces in limited batches, ensuring the highest production standards while eliminating excessive waste. They have exceptional quality. I can attest to this. They're long lasting pieces crafted with care from the best noble metals and they offer a 365 day warranty to replace or refund any piece that doesn't meet your expectations. They believe in it that much. And Ana Luisa has all this incredible high quality carbon neutrality, 
but fair prices. Their jewelry is starting at $39 with no luxury markup. You can find that 10% off coupon at analuisa.com slash hunter. You can think of these pieces as a great gift for yourself or as a gift for a loved one. I know that Mother's Day is coming up and I know my mom loves herself some hoops. They have hoops, they have beautiful celestial stars, they have necklaces, all of the highest quality. Their shipping is excellent. And as a bonus for international customers, customs taxes are included. Go to analuisa.com slash hunter. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A.com slash hunter and get 10% off. You can find that link right now wherever you're listening to the podcast. Just look at your podcast player, click on the show notes and you'll find that link for analuisa.com slash hunter for 10% off. I absolutely recommend them. They are a great brand making beautiful, sustainable jewelry. So go check out analuisa.com slash hunter. This is um, incredibly reassuring in a bunch of ways because what I teach in mindful parenting is about when we have problems, let's look at what are your needs and what are my needs, which is what you're saying. Like, it's good for them to like want to, meet their needs. Right. But it's also good for us to meet our own needs and, and kind of, and, and, and temper that agency. There's so much I want to say about like everything you said, but you're like, you talked about that. And, and also like one of the things that I'm feeling also really relieved because like one of the things that I talk about the bet, one of the best ways to stop yelling is to just basically reduce your overall stress level to like give you, you know, and that's what you're talking about. Like you need more resources if you're taxed in that way, which yes, yes, yes. Like the greater the challenge, the greater the resources we, we need. Right. Um, and then I also want to like talk about the brain and, you know, like it, it takes so much effort and that's probably why the brain takes this like shortcuts, right? Like the brain repeats patterns. Anyway, let's like go back to that though, because I want to say like you, you talk about you, you were talking, I read an interview with you that was fabulous. And you said, you can practice the skill, cultivate the experience as much as you can, giving your brain lots of practice to predict automatically in the future. And it's the idea it's the idea that you are the architect of your experience. If you seed your brain with new experiences today, this will encourage your pr- brain to predict differently tomorrow. And you were talking on CNN about resolutions, right? And and that's a this whole idea of like w- what you practice grows stronger. So we the t- the brain is tending to just repeat these old things because that's the information it has, right? Um, Yes. And because it's very, very metabolically efficient. So one thing we don't think about ourselves this way, but one thing that, um, you know, that's really important, a major constraint, I would say biologically a constraint on health and also evolution is metabolic efficiency. So whenever we get sick with a metabolic illness, like diabetes or heart disease or some cancers or depression, it's, those are all metabolic. Alzheimer's disease, those are all metabolic, those all have a metabolic basis. It means that um, your brain is running a, a body budget, which is really, really, really in the red, like a big deficit. And for one reason or another, maybe because you've been paying little taxes all along that you're, you know, you haven't been sleeping enough or you, you haven't been eating healthily, or maybe there are other stresses. Again, you know, cortisol is not a stress hormone. It's a hormone that just gets glucose into your bloodstream quickly because your brain believes you will need to do something effortful. Like when you drag your behind out of bed in the morning, right before that happens, you have a flush of cortisol because, you know, your brain is predicting that you're going to get up and move and you need glucose to, to do that. So, if, so hold on. So it's like an energy, right? Like you're saying, like what's happening in here in the brain, the, the metabolic thing, like, and that's so a way I've thought about stress in a long time, or even anxiety is that it's like an energy, right? Like there's energy going to your muscles and things like that. And and if it's coming in a time where you're not, you don't have an outlet for the energy, sometimes you just have to like get out that energy, right? Like sometimes you do because actually it's really bad for you. If your brain predicts that you have a big metabolic outlay coming, like say somebody is rude to you or, you know, 
something happens and you, you know, you feel yourself get really tense. What's happening is that your brain is preparing you for a big metabolic outlay. Now, if you don't take that outlay, if you don't do anything with that, you still have all of those chemicals circling around. And if that happens too often, your cells get insensitive to cortisol, which means that they, you're sort of tinkering with the natural mechanism for um, using energy. And it, it is, you know, if it gets, if it goes on for long enough, your immune system gets involved and you get sick, you get sick with some metabolic illness. And if that goes on for long enough, even without an, a, a direct symptom, you know, your brain will stop spending as much, right? And what does stop spending mean? That means moving less or maybe not at all and not learning, meaning just going with your predictions and not taking in any new information that you know you didn't predict, which is what we call learning when you take in new information that you don't predict. Um, and um, that's depression. Mm. And when that goes on for too long, like a really long time, um, even without a symptom, you know, uh, your brain will then start to find other ways to cut its budget like killing its own neurons. That's where that saying comes from. Like if you're not growing, you're dying, right? In some ways, right? Yeah. Well, right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and your brain really very much is a use it or lose it kind of an organ, um, very, very much. So some of the big uh, metabolic outlays we we make are like investments because we, we think we're gonna get a return on our investment. So think about exercise. You know, it's a big metabolic outlay. It feels like crap usually when you're like 10, 15 minutes into it, right when you hit your close to your ventilatory load where you're, you know, you can't expel as much carbon dioxide as you need to, you start to really feel like crap. And that's an indication that you're working really hard. <laughs> and uh, it's not an indication that you should stop. It just means that you're working really hard. And so afterwards you have to make sure that you hydrate and that you eat properly and that you sleep and so on. And it's a great investment in a healthy brain down the road. But so is learning new things. And the point that I was making is that when you expose yourself to new experiences, when you cultivate new emotions or new experiences, that's effortful. That takes effort, so it's, oh, it's costly, but it's an investment. And at first, it feels hard. And it's like driving. It feels hard. You have to give a lot of attention to it. But like driving, if you practice it over and over and over again, it gets kind of automatic. And most of the time, your brain is predicting automatically, 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 automatically. You're really not aware of it going on. And you're, you know, your brain isn't making itself aware that it's happening. It's just doing it. And then, you know, often or sometimes we don't predict something something occurs that we didn't predict or something doesn't occur that we did predict. And then there's an opportunity to learn something new and take that information in, which also is metabolically costly. So you have to be, in order to learn, you have to have the resources there to, to learn. And again, I want to say, I'm not, I'm not reducing everything to metabolism, but I think mm -hmm. this is one aspect of the dynamic that's really overlooked. Um, so for example, if your kid is really stressed at school, is being bullied or um, you know, is having some adjustment issues, that your kid's not gonna learn as well. Why? Because your kid's body budget is encumbered. And this is why um, you know, research shows really clearly that finding ways to support children's metabolism, like support their body budgets, which can mean something physical, like making sure they get enough sleep, but it can also mean something social because we're human animals. We're very social animals and we affect each other's body budgets in all kinds of social ways. Um, so that is the words that we speak to each other and the other kinds of things we do with each other, like hugs and so on, all have a consequence for body budgeting. Um, mm. So, you know, yeah, yeah. So it that it goes back to that, like at least what for the parent, like 
that's, you know, what I talk, we talk about the self-care, right. And the, you know, it, it's not what I say is that, you know, we, there's so many circumstances and so many different resources that people have and don't have, but ultimately it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves. It makes me the whole mommy martyr thing makes me like incensed because like you, what, that's exactly what you're describing. Like you, you need this metabolic, you have incredible yeah. metabolic yeah, exactly. like, costs, right? That you're yeah, incurring. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I, to me, as I'm talking about this, I think it's kind of funny. Cause I, I think, I think back to my own experience as a, as a young mother, well, I wasn't so young, but when I wasn't, or, you know, when my daughter was very young and I would go to these play groups, you know, and they were the most competitive things. I mean, I actually thought at one point of like <laughs> switching my career to become an anthropologist. I felt like I was sort of an anthropologist at these, um, you know, these play groups um, where mothers are like subtly competing with it. It's very stressful. And I'm thinking, this is not, this is, in the end, I stopped going and I just found a couple of women who also had kids in my neighborhood and we would just go for walks every day and just kind of complain to each other. And it was very cathartic because we were, <laughs> essentially, we were, we were supporting each other's body budgets really in, in, um, you know, the really interesting but and cool, but also not dangerous, but like uh, you have to be careful, I guess, is that you, you know, the, the best thing for a human body budget, for a human nervous system is another human. Uh, but the worst thing for a human nervous system is also another human. And we can make deposits and withdrawals in each other's body budgets just by speaking just the words that we speak right i can if i can make a deposit in my friend's body budget just by texting her three little words and she's halfway around the world she doesn't hear my voice she doesn't see my face it's just three little words and i can change her entire metabolism her heart rate you know um but also um uh i i can say three little words to somebody else and affect them in a negative way Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcasts right after this break. If you've been trying to cut down on carbs, sugar, or unhealthy food, you might basically realize that you can't eat anything anymore. It can feel so limiting. That's why I'm so excited that Magic Spoon is a sponsor of the podcast because it is so good for you and it is so much fun and so yummy. So Magic Spoon is a cereal company. Like think about those cereals that you had when you were kids that were that you weren't you might not even have been allowed to have because they were like sugary and you shouldn't eat them, but they were so yummy and we went to a friend's house and they were amazing. Well, Magic Spoon is that, but incredibly good for you. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And they've got amazing news. <laughs> Magic Spoon will soon be releasing two amazing new flavors this month for a limited time only. We're talking about cookies and cream and maple waffle. And if that isn't the most comforting, indulgent combination, then I don't know what is. This is the ultimate treat yourself combo, so make sure you get some while you can for a limited time. Or you can build your own box. What a very cool gift this would be. You know, you can blend cocoa, fruited, frosted, peanut butter, and cinnamon. And if you're listening from Canada, Magic Spoon now ships there as well. Go to magicspoon.com slash hunter to grab the new limited edition cookies and cream maple waffle or a custom bundle of cereal to try today. And be sure to use the promo code hunter at checkout to save $5 off your order. This offer is now good anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, but only when you use our code at checkout. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com hunter and use the code hunter to save $5 off. 
Thanks so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. It's amazing how interconnected we are. I have so many things I want to ask you because I also want to ask you about like meditation and what's happening there. But I really am curious also, like you said that emotions aren't happening to you. Your brain makes them as you need them. You are the architect of your own experience. And I feel like this is a very hopeful statement. And I've always been curious about this because I... I tend to, I've had a habit in my life of just like waking up with anxiety. And so I sometimes I, I like question, like what's coming first is like the sensation of my body coming first, the thought, you know, like what's coming first, but you say that emotions aren't happening to you. Can you just explain that statement? A little? Sure. I mean, the thing is that there's no circuit in your brain that triggers and makes you anxious. As you, I know the feeling, I think I know the feeling that you're talking about where as you're emerging into consciousness in the morning, you start to, your mind starts to race about all the things that you have to do in the day. And um, you start to feel like just not getting out of bed. You know, like it's just, it's just, it feels like a wave of anxiety, but really what it is, is a wave of arousal. I don't mean sexual arousal, but mm -hmm. you know, when your brain is preparing you for a big metabolic outlay, you experience that as high arousal, a racing heart, or if things are really uncertain or ambiguous, there's a, a neuromodulator, a chemical, which the brain uses to help neurons, to help the neurons, some neurons you know, um, make this chemical and it helps other neurons to learn faster. So, but it's, it feel, it makes you feel uh, jittery and like, you know, on edge basically. So a lot of what we call anxiety, our go-to explanation is anxiety is really, we have an, un, you know, we're running a body budgeting deficit. There's a lot of uncertainty. And um, so there's a lot of arousal. And humans typically experience arousal as not so pleasant. Um, you know, sometimes it's pleasant, but sometimes it's not pleasant. And a lot of times it's not pleasant. And actually you can train people to um, take unpleasant arousal and, and make meaning of it in a different way as this is an evidence of like, you know, you're preparing for a fight or you're being determined or, um, and it can change people's behavior in really remarkable ways. So you can take someone who has like terrible test anxiety which could, you know, ultimately lead them to ultimately in college. I mean, test anxiety can actually lead people to fail, not just a course, but out of college, which can affect their learning. I mean, their earning histories, you know, it, hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout their lifetime. And you can teach them how to, how to, how their brains can learn to predict differently about what that arousal means. Um, and so that they experience determination instead of, anxiety and it actually changes their ability to perform on tests and even stay in school. So would this be like, so one of the tools I use is visualization. Like I invite people to like imagine they're like about to yell, they're getting, they're getting, they're feeling that arousal and then stay with it and not act on it and, or take a, imagine taking different actions. Is this kind of what you would do in a situation like that, where you're feeling that and you're, you would just like practice this almost mentally, the, the, switching yeah, exactly. From, yes, yeah, okay. yes, exactly. Exactly. So one thing that I used to do, and I should say, you know, I did not come to this. I did not come to this view. This is not a natural view for me to hold. I would just say like, I, I I'm actually really quite a curmudgeon. And, uh, as a scientist, I, even amongst my scientist friends, I'm very skeptical. So I don't believe anything until, you know, the data show me again and again and again and again. And I, I don't really trust my own experience as really useful for explaining anything. Um, that's just the hazards I think of being a scientist. Um, but you know, the research showed again and again and again, that the experience of awe is very, very useful. It really gives your, usually it gives your nervous system a bit of a break because for a minute you feel like a speck. And if you're a speck, all your problems are a speck. It just makes, it just takes big problems and makes them feel small for a minute. And I thought, okay, fine. The research shows that this is useful. So I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it, <laughs> but it's remarkable. Actually, it really is. At first it, it was hard to do. 
Um, but I practiced it every day for like five minutes. So I'd be walking on the street. I'd see, you know, an ugly like dandelion poke out of like a crack of a sidewalk, you know, and I'd say, oh, this is an, ex this is an opportunity to experience the power of nature. You know, nature will not be contained by, you know, humanity's lame attempt to constrain it. And so I would yeah. try to take this dandelion and make it into a moment of awe that felt as profound as looking at the stars or listening to a symphony of crickets at night or watching the, you know, uh, waves roll in. And after a while, I was able to do it really automatically, like just to switch into that mode because I'd practiced it quite a bit. And what mindfulness does, I mean, I'm not talking about mindfulness meditation here, but just mindfulness, right? So you remember that, you know, your brain is using past experiences that it can combine in novel ways to predict and explain the sense data from the world and from the body. And the situation that you're in right now launches the next set of predictions that your brain will make. So you, if you want to predict differently in the moment, one thing you can do is you can get up and move your body, go some, go to another situation, and then you will be predicting differently, hopefully, if you're paying attention to the world. But let's say you can't. You, you can actually figuratively change your environment by just paying attention to different features of your environment. Mm -hmm. So for example, one thing we do when we, are, when we do yoga is that we are paying attention to small sensory changes that are always there in our bodies, but that we normally don't pay attention to. Like if you're standing right now, there's a pressure that you can feel against the sole of your feet. Or if you're sitting right now, there's the pressure of the bottom of the chair against your legs or the back of the chair against your back. That, so sense data are there, they're available to be attended to, but usually they're in the background of attention, but you can bring them into the forefront of attention. And then they become the experiences that you're the raw material for the experiences that you're constructing. So you, you actually have quite a bit of, well, let's just say that you have more control. We all have moments where we feel like we have no control over what we feel, but we all have more control over what we experience and what we feel than we think we do. And the secret is to understand that control doesn't always mean changing what you feel in the moment, it can mean changing how you understand the meaning of what you feel, of what affect means, these sensations that give you affect. What do they mean in this situation? And if you practice enough, you can do it really automatically without very much effort whatsoever. The thing that's really hard to do is if you're running a body budgeting deficit and you feel like crap, you can, you can work with the meaning of what that is and what you should do about it, but turning down the dial on that crappy feeling is very, very hard because it's rooted in something really biological. I mean, everything you feel is rooted in something biological, but this is, you know, this is body budgeting. So survival stuff. <laughs> it's survival stuff. So, you know, um, but you can, but you can change the, the meaning of what, right. So when I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling really, um, you know, dragged out and I don't feel like I have the spoons to, you know, like just do what I need to do in a given day. The first question I ask myself is not what is wrong with my life or what is wrong with me? It is did I get enough sleep last night? Did I exercise yesterday? Did I eat healthfully, right? I'm not trying to minimize the psychological meaning of things here. I'm just saying that underneath the psychological is this really basic physical stuff that we mostly don't pay attention to. And in fact, if we had to architect a lifestyle that would easily bankrupt a human body budget, it would be the one that we live in. Oh man. 
yeah, zero physical exercise at this point during the pandemic, zero like social connections separate from other people, yeah. no support if you have kids, small kids. and Sure. But also not enough sleep and being on, you know, being on the computer is great, except, you know, it's great in the, the sense of we can talk to each other and have social connection, but being on the computer too late, you know, there are, there is, there are frequencies of light that come from your computer that stimulate ganglia in your retina that tell your brain it, that it's daytime. Yeah. If you are looking at your computer screen at night, you are basically serving yourself up a circadian rhythm disorder eventually. And that will really screw with your body budget. And of course, none of these things happen like immediately. That's the other thing. It's that they're these like little pernicious taxes that we pay. They're, they're so small in a given instant that we might not even notice, but they add up over time. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, when you have like water dripping on a metal pipe, it doesn't affect the pipe the first time, the 10th time, the 100th time, but eventually that water, that dripping water is going to bore a hole through that steel. It's just going to take a long time. And that's exactly the way your metabolism works. That when you have a drag on your metabolism, when you're paying a little tax, because things aren't as efficient as they need to be, when you're not sleeping properly, whatever the reason is, it adds up over time. And, um, and this is true for adults and it's really true for kids. So, you know, I mean, for kids, any kind of childhood adversity, if it's persistent, will increase the likelihood of illness in your children when they become uh, late adolescents and adults. It's just really, really, really important that people understand this. So what I'm hearing from you is to take care of us in a sense as the human animal and the child as the human animal, not, you know, like that, those, those biological regulation pieces are really, really big and important. You're, you're making me glad I was obsessive about my kids sleep when they were little. One last question I wanted to ask. I, there's so many questions I wanted to ask, but you, you, uh, you mentioned in your, uh, in your article on, um, or your interview on resolutions that you were going to start knitting. Are you still knitting? I am. Look at good for you. I'm knitting. Yeah. yeah. I practiced and practiced and practiced. It's really much better than my first attempt at that. And well, this is like my, not my first attempt. So oh, yeah. I, I knit a bunch of little, you know, swatches um, to, to sort of teach myself to knit. And then this is my first attempt at us. I'm, I'm going to make, a, I'm making a shawl. Um, oh, and uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So no, yes, I am. And I, I knit every single day and, uh, and I, you know, I do yoga every day and I actually exercise every day. And believe me when I tell you, I never would have predicted that those kinds of words would come out of my mouth, like <laughs> exercise, yoga, and knitting, not three things I ever thought I would be doing in my life. My mother, of course, is just laughing her head off about knitting. Right. But, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you can, you need to find the, the, uh, ways that you can um, be nice to your body. Um, there, we don't have a lot of people. Don't have a lot of options, but everybody has some option. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to uh, have you come back on to talk about meditation because now I'm like dying to think um, think about that. But I'm I, I think that's amazing, and I love that your your how you shared your experience with that because I know to get to the place of being a you know, director of interdisciplinary uh, science lab and to work at Harvard Medical and all do be like this incredible researcher, you had to work really hard and be a, quite an achiever, I imagine. For sure, yeah. for sure. But I just want to say that, you know, I still like you, or I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I still have to drag my ass out of bed in the morning sometimes. <laughs> and I still have some days where, you know, I just don't feel like I can, you know, like I've just got the spoons to like make it through the day. And I still have days where, um, you know, where I'm not really sure, am I doing the right thing? Did I, should I, you know, I, I'm like everybody else, right? I mean, um, 
but I just try to remind myself that um, the most important thing, I mean, listen, if you, you know, sleep properly and, um, you know, eat healthily and, you know, knit or whatever, you know, it's, you could still be depressed. You could still, bad things can still happen. Right. But the point is that um, they're less likely to happen. If you find ways of just taking care of your body budget, it will let you care for your children better. And, um, and it will also let you be a little more compassionate with yourself, which I think, you know, frankly, there's a lot of discussion about being more compassionate with each other. And I think that's important and we should be, but I also think it's important to be compassionate with yourself, especially for mothers, especially for mothers. And, um, and if you can do that, that is, I, I think, uh, you know, it sets you up for more success in your life, whatever that means to you. Lisa, I'm so honored that you took the time to share your time with us today. I love your work. It's fascinating. Where can people find out more about you and your, your books? Sure. I have a, I have a popular website called lisafeldmanbarrett.com. It's just my name.com. This has uh, information about both books um, as well as many free videos and articles that I've written for the New York Times and other newspapers and magazines. Um, there's also an academic website for my lab, uh, but that has all of our academic papers online, 250 plus papers. Um, those are all academic papers though. So, uh, you know, they, they are, they're written full of scientific jargon and, <laughs> but, but it, they're all there and they're also available and all of it's for all, all the information is there for, for um, if you're looking for more. Oh, and I should say both books also have, I built web notes for both books. So each book comes with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of web pages of information. If you want to dig into the science uh, of any given topic a little bit more, all, all that information is also available. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for doing the work that you do, taking the natural curiosity you have and aiming it in these directions and in such an incredible way. And, and I really thank you for the books and writing and, and, and speaking in such a way that you can share this widely. It really makes a big impact and a big ripple effect. And I, I really appreciate it. And I really it's my, appreciate it. It's my real pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Wow, isn't that amazing? I love this conversation. I need to listen to it again. So if you want to listen to it in a different way, you can go to the new Mindful Mama YouTube channel. Make sure when you're there, you subscribe to help us grow this channel and get it out. It's a little fledgling little baby channel, but you'll get to see clips, some of your favorite clips from this episode. You can see them in YouTube. And that's just such a great way to share it. If you have something that was meaningful to you, to share it on social media, that's a great way to do it. And I love when, of course, you reach out to me and connect with me. I would love to see a screenshot of when you're listening to this, of what your takeaways are. You know, are you going to be listening to this one again? Because I'm sure I'm going to have to. It's so powerful. You know, there it is. It's the science. It's right there. It's it's so fascinating. I love this stuff. So. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I am so glad to be connecting with you. I'm so glad you are here with me on this journey in the podcast. I'm so glad that you are part of the healing doing this work. Remember, if you want to take it deeper, you want to learn about the Mindful Parenting membership, be part of the deeper community around the world with hundreds of families around the world, get on the wait list, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com, get on the wait list and we'll let you know when it opens. And in the meantime, I'm just wishing you peace because you know, as you create more peace in yourself, you do create more peace for everyone. So thank you for being with me on that journey to do that. Have a good week, my friend. Namaste. I say definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's 
so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them and not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You'll be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. mindfulparentingcourse.com